Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, we're just going to give a few minutes um, to allow everyone else to join. So please stay tuned. Thank you to those um, people just joining now. Um, for, we're just uh, giving a few minutes for others to join. So we're gonna start in a second. All right, everyone, um, we're going to start the webinar. And so um, welcome to ACES 101. And I'd like to introduce um, Monique Morris, who's going to make introductions. But first, I want to run through a few housekeeping items. So um, for those of you on desktops and cell phones, um, you could change the settings to reduce some of the visual distractions. So on your desktop, if you want to um, click on the drop down menu to select view who's talking. That will just help um, streamline the presentation. And on your cell phone or tablet, you could swipe left to slides or right uh, to see the presenters. Also, if you have a question, um, you can go into the questions box and type it, um, and we will be sure to answer during our Q&A session. Um, if you're on your phone, um, the picture is here where you could just look at the bottom of your screen and there's a question mark. And then at the end of the webinar, if you have time to stay on, uh, we have Johanna Thompson who's going to um, stay on for our office hours to talk about how to, um, to implement ACEs. She's an educator uh, with experience in the field. And so now I'm going to pass it to Monique Morris to do the introductions. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. Good morning and good afternoon to all who are on today. Um, on behalf of the National Black Women's Justice Institute and our partners, the Center on Poverty and Inequality at Georgetown, we're so pleased to have you on today to talk about ACEs 101 for teachers and girls of color. Um, as we all know, ACEs is, is uh, as an emerging science and the exploration of trauma among uh, young people in schools is one of the most important ways that we can begin to access equity and begin to discuss wellness in a way that's useful for all of us. And so we're very pleased to be able to uh, welcome all of you and our partners in this work. I would like to introduce uh, Johanna Thompson, uh, who is new to the NBWJI team, who um, comes to us with experience in public health and education who, as Becca mentioned, will be on following this uh, presentation to have office hours. Um, the practical experience is always helpful, so we hope that you'll be able to stay on for that. Joining us today and actually uh, leading this conversation and presenting through the moderation of Johanna and Rebecca Epstein, who's the executive director at the center, uh, is uh, Jeanette Pye Espinosa and Dr. Stephanie Covington. And I'd like to take a moment to read their bios. Jeanette Pai Espinoza is the president of the National Crittenden and director of the National Girls Initiative. Uh, she brings more than 40 years of experience in advocacy, education, public policy, strategic communication, program development, and direct service delivery. Through National Crittenden and Critten agencies, her work supports more than 130,000 girls annually by providing a comprehensive mix of gender and culturally responsive trauma-informed and specific, developmentally appropriate, strength-based services to girls and young women who are survivors of multiple forms of adverse childhood experiences and violence. It's really important work and thrilled that she's on. In 2013, Jeanette was recognized by the Robert F. Kennedy Embracing the Legacy Award for her work supporting the empowerment of girls and young women in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems and she holds a master's of education in student development theory, counseling, and administration. Thank you, Jeanette, for being on. Also joining us is Dr. Stephanie Covington, and she is a clinician, author, organizational consultant, and lecturer. Uh, 
She has been recognized for her pioneering work in the area of women's issues. Um, she specializes in the development and implementation of gender responsive and trauma-informed services in both public and private sectors. She's educated at Columbia University and the Union Institute and served on the faculties of the University of Southern California, San Diego State University, and the California School of Professional Psychology. She's published extensively, including eight manualized treatment programs. Um, she's based in La Jolla, California, where she's co-director of both the Institute for Relational Development and the Center for Gender and Justice. Dr. Covington, thank you so much for being on. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Monique. And hello, everyone. Um, today's my job is to sort of kick this off and talk a little bit about some basics about ACEs and about trauma. So next slide, please. Um, ACEs, can I get the next slide, please? Thanks. ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And this study is really getting a lot of attention. Um, it's interesting, it was originally done in 1998, so it was done 20 years ago. 17,000 adults responded to 10 questions about their lives before age 18. But for the first 10 years, people didn't pay much attention to this. But in the past 10 years, this study and the information it has provided has been really embraced. And now there are hundreds of thousands of people who have answered these basic 10 questions. Next slide, please. And then why is this really important? Well, because the ACE study has really acknowledges the traumatic events that are in our society. It shows how often people are experiencing these and how they often link to mental and physical health challenges that people are experiencing. So it's a, it's a study that talks about risk, not necessarily causation, but what are the correlations? So on the next slide, please, we'll a few definitions. So we're all sort of operating, if you will, off, off the same foundation. Trauma-informed is a word that has really also uh, resonates with people. And it means, and a lot of people use it, but don't really know what it means. It means the universal knowledge we have about adversity and trauma and how it affects people and communities and society. So trauma-informed is essentially what we know. Then trauma-responsive are those policies and practices that we put in place based on what we know. So this means in schools developing a safe and supportive learning environment. So trauma responsive is what we trauma specific. Next slide, please. Trauma specific are those services that are really designed to address the violence and the trauma that someone has experienced. So that is really the services we for, provide. So we have trauma informed our knowledge, trauma responsive, what we do, trauma specific, what we provide. Next slide, please. So the rationale, why would this be important? Well, what happens when schools become trauma informed and trauma responsive, schools become safer, staff jobs become easier, and teaching becomes more effective. And then when people use trauma specific materials, this really increases and enhances her potential for long-term resilience. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit you know, about stress and about trauma, because a lot of people will say, well, it had such a traumatic day at work. Well, often that means I had a stressful day. So there's positive stress in our lives. That's the stress, the normal stress that comes from the positive things that happen in our lives that we want, but often are stressful. Getting married, having a child, um, getting a job promotion, positive stress. Tolerable stress is probably that stressful day you had at work. You had a stressful day, you leave the stressor work, and the stress level goes down. So we all experience tolerable stress, and it waves up and down. But then there's destructive stress, and that's where we see the relentless stress, the toxic stress, and the traumatic stress. Next slide, please. So relentless stress, are the stressors you can't take a vacation from. These are the stressors you don't get away from. So particularly as a child, this could be poverty, hunger, racism, sexism, living in a violent household, living in a violent community, uh, your parent is, has a drug addiction problem, your parent has been incarcerated, or you as a child are now the caregiver. You're, you're what we call the parentification of a child. You've become, you've become the parent. So these are stressors that are embedded and someone cannot get away from. 
Next slide, please. So we've learned that the stress of adversity is toxic to the development of the brain. Years ago, when we talked about trauma, we talked about the psychological implications. But now we know from the study of the brain that it, it has a huge impact on the body, physiologically, and on brain development. So this is a particularly important consideration when we think about children. And so in utero, the first five years of life and adolescence are three primary areas and times of brain development, and the stress of adversity becomes toxic stress and impacts the development of the brain. Next slide. And so children end up their primary issues that they then struggle with if they've had uh, toxic stress or traumatic stress. Uh, one is part of the brain that is, deals with attachment. And so we see often see girls who are struggling with attachment disorders, uh, challenges. They have difficulty with relationships, difficulty trusting people, lack of connection. The other part of the brain that has to do with regulation, being able to regulate your feelings, being able to deal with your behavior. So we see uh, what we call emotional dysregulation or unmanageable, be unmanageable behavior. And then the third area is part of the brain that has to do with learning and competencies. So this becomes a very important consideration when we think about, particularly in schools, trying to teach kids, right? So traumatic events themselves can take many, many different forms. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, abandonment, neglect, loss of a loved one, life-threatening violence as a caregiver. Next slide, please. Witnessing domestic violence, being involved in an automobile accident, bullying, a life-threatening health situation or painful medical procedure. Next slide, please. Witnessing or experiencing community violence. Think about how many girls you may be working with and supporting who live in a community where there's shootings and stabbings and fighting and or a lot of police activity. As I mentioned before, having your parent incarcerated, those life-threatening natural disasters, certainly here in California, are recent fires and what that has meant to communities. Next slide, please. Acts of terrorism, and this is whether you experience it in person or on television, living in a chronically chaotic environment where there's no consistency in terms of resources. So when we begin to think about working with children, we have to look at what kinds of experiences they've also been involved in. So in the next slide. Now, more recently, we've been going also to talk about historical trauma or cultural trauma. And this occurs across generations. Uh, here in the United States, this would be our native Hawaiian population, our African American population, our native American population. The populations or groups of people that in our culture as a group have experienced this cultural trauma. And so, of course, when we're talking about girls of color, you can see it's not only what they've experienced in their individual lives, but also as a group or a class of people. Next slide. And so this historical trauma is really the accumulation of this emotional and psychological wounding that, that comes. Next slide. So that gives you a little background information, a little bit about being trauma-informed. But now let's look specifically about girls, particularly girls of color. What about the world of girls? Next slide, please. Because what we begin to see are gender differences when we look at abuse, particularly interpersonal abuse. So in childhood, both boys and girls are at risk from family members and people they know. That's their greatest risk. Even though families continue to tell their kids, you know, be careful of strangers, the risk is usually people they know. Now we begin to see the difference uh, in adolescence. So for a young man, for a boy or a young man getting into his teenage years, he's going to be at greater risk if he's gay, if he's a young man of color, if he's a gang member, if he's transitioning, and his risk is going to come from people who dislike him. It might be his peers, it might be the police. A young woman's risk in her adolescent years, her greatest risk comes from the person she's in relationship with, someone to whom she's saying, I love you. If you move into adulthood, for a man, his greatest risk if he's serving in the military, 
is harm from the enemy if he's in combat. Uh, if he's living in our communities, his greatest risk for harm comes by being a victim of crime committed by a stranger. Compare that to the woman who in her adult life, if she serves in the military, her greatest risk comes from the people she's serving with. And if she's in living in the free world in our communities, her greatest risk comes from her relationships. So we very seldom see a male who has been abused in relationships with people he know, knew from childhood, adolescence, adulthood. But that's a very common scenario when we work with females. And then it's really important to understand that our LGBTQ population and gender nonconforming are at highest risk. So we begin to see when we consider gender, some of the differences here we need to consider when we, when we understand trauma. Next slide, please. So for girls, childhood abuse and dating violence. Those are, those are primary risk in interpersonal violence. And the common responses are the use of alcohol or other drugs, developing mental health issues, suicide attempts, and self-harm. So we begin to see these connections between something that happened and then what the response is. Next slide, please. If we look at the juvenile justice system, we see another gender difference here. Now, for years, people talked about the school-to-prison pipeline. With more recent research, particularly that done um, by uh, Rebecca Epstein and the Georgetown Law Center, is that for girls, it really seems to be a sexual abuse pipeline into prison. So again, we see the whole issue of trauma in terms of juvenile justice involvement. Next slide. Some more risk slides. One in six girls, one in 14 boys experience childhood sexual abuse. Girls and young women, 16 to 24, highest rates of intimate partner violence. 65% of adolescent girls are victims of physical, emotional, verbal, or sexual abuse from a dating partner. And again, I really want to reiterate, lesbian, bisexual, transgender population is highest risk. And when we look back in that other slide, when I said the juvenile justice system, what do we see there? We see girls of color and gender non-conforming girls are overly represented in the juvenile justice system. Next slide, please. So I want to just sort of show you this slide. It's got a lot of information on, on it. But I want to help you to see kind of the process and the connection between things. So there's a traumatic event that essentially overwhelms a girl's capacity to cope physically and psychologically. Notice the physical and the psychological. There's the immediate response to trauma, and that's where we hear about fight, flight, freeze. But what happens is she ends up with a sensitized nervous system. There are changes in the brain, both the brain chemistry as well as the brain functions and the brain-body connection, because the brain is what gives messages to the body. And that those messages now can become scrambled. Then there's psychological and physical distress. It could be a current stressor. It could be the experience of being arrested. It could be the experience of, of moving. It could be the experience of going to a new school. It could be a reminder of trauma, what we call the triggers, the sensations, the thoughts, the feelings, um, the smells that when the girl experiences it, it pushes her back in time and she's flooded by feelings that belong to the time and place when the traumatic event happened. And then at the bottom of this chart, you see the typical responses. Those retreat responses of what we, nope, back to the chart, please. Thank you, back a slide, thanks. So we see the retreat responses, the isolation, dissociation, depression, anxiety, what we might consider mental health responses, the harmful behavior to self, substance use disorders, eating disorders, suicide, um, deliberate self-harm, harmful behavior to others, the aggression, the violence, the rages, and physical health issues. Long list there. So what's happened in our society is that those things across the bottom are the services we provide in our communities. But very often we're providing mental health, substance abuse treatment, anger management, physical health care, and we're never going back up the chart, considering it, what may this be linked to? What role is trauma playing? And this is where the ACE study really helps us understand this. So if I could have the next slide, please. So as I said, the ACE study 
10 questions before age 18. So what I'd like you to do is to make two lists, if you would, please. If you make two lists, numbers one through 10, and I'm going to give you these questions, and I'd like you to answer them twice, please. I'd like you to answer them once for yourself, your personal answers before age eight, and then I'd like you to answer them for how you think a typical girl of color, some girl that maybe is in your schools, a girl that you're supporting, uh, how you think she might answer this, okay? So here are the 10 questions, all before age 18. Yes or no answers, and I'm gonna go pretty quickly, okay? First one, recurrent severe emotional abuse. Did you experience recurrent severe emotional abuse? Yes or no for yourself? Yes or no for the girl of color that you're supporting? Second question is the recurrent and severe physical abuse. Again, answering that yes or no twice, once for self, once for the girl. Third question, contact sexual abuse. Fourth question, emotional neglect. Remembering before age 18, answering twice. Fifth question, experiencing physical neglect. Okay, next slide, please. And then also, did you grow, before age 18, did you grow up in a household where both biological parents were not present? Maybe you grew up with your grandmother, maybe you grew up with foster care. Um, so that's question six, answering again twice. Question seven, was your mother being treated violently? Eight, did you grow up with an alcoholic or drug using family member? Nine, did you grow up with a family member who was mentally ill, chronically depressed, or attempted suicide? And 10, was there a family member who was imprisoned? Okay, so now count up the yes answers. And you'll have a score for yourself between 0 and 10. And you'll have a score for a girl between 0 and 10. So next slide, please. And then what we'd like you to do, uh, did the poll not happen? Huh. Well, sorry, I thought we were going to have a slide. Yeah. With poll. I'll administer the poll right now. OK, thank you. OK. There. So. Okay, if you will select uh, for yourself what your score between zero and 10 and just check that and submit it, and then the computer's gonna do a very nice compilation for us. Okay, and when you finish that slide, we've got the next one, and that's going, so if we can get get the next slide, please. Whoops. No, you, you were gonna have the slide for the girls' scores. Right, so um, first we'll share the results. Okay. Um, and this is um, the results of what is your A score? Um, okay. Sorry, we can only do one. Okay, got it. Okay, so this, this shows you just among the group that's on this webinar uh, what the A scores are. Okay, great. Okay, now we're going to have another slide, which is the girls poll, and for the score that the girls got, the girls, okay. So if you'll click on the number that represents what you thought the A score might be for a girl that girl of color that you're supporting, and then submit that. Looks like people are just still responding, so we'll give three more seconds. Okay. Three, two, one. Okay, closing and sharing results. So look at the girls. So we can see this is so important that um, many of you have are here, but what we want to pay attention to particular are scores of four or more. Okay, great. So now let's go back to the other slides. Okay, so when they did the A study, that original one, they first looked at four things, smoking, alcoholism, injection of illegal drugs, and obesity, and they found that a score of four or more seemed to be the cutoff point, that when people had a score of four or more yeses on those 10 questions, they were at higher risk for one or more of these 20, 30, 40 years later. Then they went back and they looked at chronic illness, and at this point, they have actually analyzed this data every which way. Started with 17,000 people, then another 26,000 people in 
five different states took it, and now hundreds of thousands of people have done this. So let's look at the next slide. Here's just one piece of how they looked at it in terms of learning and behavioral problems. They found that if someone had a zero score, only about 3% of those people were having trouble in school. But someone with a score of four or more, 51% of them were having difficulty in school. So as I said, there's much more information, and we actually have a, a chapter on the ACE study as part of the materials that will be on the website for you to read more about this. Next slide. And so what we find is stress, adversity, and trauma touches everyone's life, but the more it happens, the longer it lasts, the earlier it starts. The more it happens because of people, the more challenging its effects. Next slide. And so what we're talking about here, so this is our information about trauma, but being trauma responsive means a shift in culture, taking what we know and doing things differently. Next slide. And so when we think about schools, it would mean that what would be, a, what would be the goal is for all school staff to understand trauma and its impact on both how kids are learning as well as behavior. This needs to be incorporated into all the school services, not just the classroom. And establishing both physical and emotional safety to prevent re-traumatization. Next slide. Have to understand the gender differences because how we approach this with boys and with girls is different. Looking for those unnecessary triggers that are in our educational system and also helping students identify their own individual triggers. Creating an atmosphere that's respectful and safe and maximizing a student's ability to make choices and have some control. When someone has been abused, they have lost their sense of choice and their sense of control. Next slide. Even this simple question, if, if each person working in a school setting could change that automatic question in their mind, which is like, I wonder what is wrong with her. Do I wonder what's happened to her? And we all need to do this even in our personal as well as professional lives. What are those, what question, when we change the question, it changes our attitude, it changes the way we look at someone. Next question, next slide please. Relational trauma needs relational repair. Next slide. Which means how we're engaging with girls makes a difference. So I'm going to quickly give you some quick tools, and you'll find some of these also on the website after the webinar. So let's next slide, please. One, moving from trauma-informed to trauma-responsive, there's materials that help people go through a guided process, whether it's a school, a hospital, a criminal justice system. So there's that in terms of organizational change. Next slide. There needs to be healing-centered engagement that involves art and movement and touch. Next slide. It's not just the head. I'm going to show you a picture from an uh, elementary school in Nashville, Tennessee, where they, next slide, where they created what they call their peace corner. Soft things. A child in a classroom was feeling overstimulated or having difficulty can go sit there. San Francisco and their grade schools, they call it the cozy corner. So places where children can go to begin to self-regulate. Next slide. A sensory box. We'll show a picture of this. This is a box created by an older girl. Next slide. Where pictures of things that are important to her, meaningful to her. And then the next slide, let's look at what's inside. The things she uses that help comfort her if she's feeling stressed. A squeeze ball, some coloring. A feather. Next slide. This slide shows you some things. These are cards, and, and young people use these things to remind them of things they can do when they're feeling distressed, right? Spend time in nature, do mindfulness, breathing exercise. Next slide. And these are cards also. These two things are also going to be in your web. On the, website. This comes from Karen Trishman, a, a therapist that does really creative work with young people. She's located in the UK, but you can get her materials. Next slide. 
And so this whole thing about encouraging self-regulation and teaching skills, the two that I use in the lot, five senses exercise and breathing, next slide. And what you'll also find on the website is some language for a brief conversation. Now back, please, because, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Because you can um, actually do something in 20, I need you to go back to the last, thank you. Uh, you can do something in 10 minutes with a girl. You can have a conversation with her and you can teach her two very simple coping exercises, breathing exercises. These will also be on the website for you. Next slide. We also have a program for girls that, that deals with trauma. So there's information about that. Next slide. And I'm going to invite you to a conference in Connecticut in June where we're going to be talking more about all this for two and a half days and materials and, and how to implement these things. And the next slide, please. I think what I'd like you to, to leave you with is what is the antidote to ACEs? What about, what do we do for girls of color who have had so many of these challenging life experiences? And the antidote to all this is really connectedness. Connection to a caring adult. This is what builds resilience. And so each one of us can become that caring adult. What we want to do in a girl's life is create relational wealth versus relational poverty. So thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, I'm Rebecca Epstein. As was mentioned before, I'm at the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality. And I just wanted to ask you a quick question. I want to be mindful of time. Um, but I just wanted to elevate the issue that even though students may have very high ACE scores, as you just demonstrated through the poll, this is really about all of us. Because not only do ACEs affect um, people directly, but also indirectly. So I wondered if you could talk just a little bit about how educators should reckon and recognize their own ACE scores um, and also um, the vicarious trauma that they might experience from working with students who may have high ACE scores in terms of self-care. Yeah, I think and self-care seems to be something that's really difficult for people because and you've just said it, there's your own ACE score, but then there's what can happen by working with girls or people who've had a lot of trauma. And self-care really boils down to simple things none of us do enough of. Eating the right food, getting enough rest, going to the funny movie, laughing. It's about life balance and, and really taking care of oneself and being cognizant of the fact that you can, be, you can have a low A score, but because of your workplace and the challenges there, uh, can be the challenges because of the students, it can be the challenges because of how the school system may operate. You can be impacted and not realize it, but self-care is the bottom line. That really is, and not becoming isolated. Connectedness is really the key. And connectedness is important for all of us, I'm sure. Well, thank you so much, and I wanted to remind um, the attendees that they'll have um, a chance to ask questions directly of Stephanie at the end of our session and also talking about self-care and any other questions with um, Johanna at the end of the webinar, who herself um, is an educator. So I wanna make sure that we have enough time to throw this to Jeanette. So Jeanette, if you would like to start your presentation now, we're excited to hear from you about your work with ACEs. Great, I'm gonna adjust myself. So uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. Um, I am going to um, spend a little bit of time focusing specifically on, on the experience of girls of color in school and also to try to offer you all some food for thought and what happens um, as we look at the data. It's pretty clear that girls of color, particularly black girls, um, are disproportionately represented in school discipline procedures as well as in the juvenile justice system. Um, how does that happen? Why does it happen? And how do well-meaning individuals who care about kids contribute to that? So that's a little bit about what I'm going to try to get us to. Um, next slide, please. So I think um, one of the things uh, about my own experience that I don't talk about a lot because it's very, very, very far back in my history is that I um, 
taught conflict resolution in middle school and high school in the 1990s, uh, and also founded an alternative school for boys and girls who were involved in violent and bias motivated um, sort of infractions or situations at school. So I bring that background with me too, as I um, share some information with you today. So just a little bit about Crittenden so you know who we are. We were founded in 1883. Uh, you can see it on the screen to address the needs and potential of the most marginalized girls across the country. Uh, we still, that is still our, our uh, focus today. Our mission today really centers on creating both social and system change. So how do we as a country look at, at girls and gender nonconforming youth? Um, and how do we use an intersectional lens in everything that we do, and in particular in advocating for system change, um, and specifically for girls who are impacted by, as Stephanie talked about, ACEs chronic adversity. So yeah, girls with scores four and higher, but even in our case, girls with scores of seven to 10, which as you saw from the poll, uh, makes sense. Violence and injustice, and really do that through national advocacy, but also capacity building support for the Crittenden family of agencies and sort of the, the, the growing field of those who advocate um, and follow the leadership of girls and young women for change. Uh, the Crittenden family of agencies consists of 26 organizations that actually provide services, this is a mistake, in 31 states and the District of Columbia to girls, young women, and their families. Uh, they provide a wide array of services, uh, including in school and after school programs, and a number of them actually operate gender responsive schools across the country. A special shout out to Crittenden agency folks that might be on the webinar. So, next slide, please. So the question is, let's set the context a little bit. Are ACEs a new thing? Um, so I'm gonna take you back in time to 1900. Uh, the advantage of being 135 years old is that you have really old data. The disadvantage of being 100 years old is when things haven't changed, you have to ask yourself, interrogate yourself about how you contributed to that. And so that's part of how uh, we started looking at ACE. So this, what's up on the screen, uh, is the summary from the annual Crittenden report for 1900. Uh, that would have been done with about 52 agencies at that time around the country. Uh, and it found that the average age of girls who came into Crittenden agencies was 17 years old. Uh, and they came for six principal reasons, improper home conditions, brutality in the home, bad companions involved in illicit activities, lack of proper training, betrayal by those in whom they place confidence and brutal sex acts. So you can see 118 years later from that report, uh, not very much of change, much has changed. And if you talk to direct service providers, um, particularly those in Crittenden agencies, they would tell you that the, what has changed is that girls are younger and their needs are more acute. Uh, and these are the girls that are in your schools. Next slide, please. So, um, in 2012, uh, the Crittenden agencies decided to administer the ACE across our agencies across the country. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit, just a tiny, tiny snapshot of results from the most recent administration, which was 2014. Uh, that administration included 16 states, 70% of those servant that participated were female, 26% were male. The majority of respondents were between the ages of 10 and 18. Uh, in terms of race and ethnicity, 50% were white and 46% were girls and young women of color. We asked a, a whole lot of other demographic characteristics, but this is sort of the basic breakdown. Um, if you're interested in learning more about what we found in that study, um, we have a brief called Beyond ACE and it's available at our website, on our website. Next slide, please. So just I'm just gonna share with you two slides um, that sort of summarize the response from the 2014 uh, administration. You can clearly see, um, and this is true in the CDC ACE study also, that females' scores tended to skew higher than males. Uh, but this is a specific population of girls and, and boys that are system involved, both child welfare and juvenile justice in after school programs. Um, uh, sort of the array of programs that you might imagine. So you can see here that girl scores um, are higher than boys, and particularly as you look at the eight, nines, and tens. This is a, a unique thing that we found in this administration that was not true in the first one, which is there's this very defined group of girls who have scores of eight, nines, and tens. Um, and not only does that distinguish them in terms of their A score, but in terms of 
of well-being domains, it, it's very clearly reflected in the research that we did on well-being domains. Obviously, there's being much uh, less connected, higher levels of stress. Um, but the interesting thing is that the difference really between a score of a seven and an eight was pretty significant. And that's something we had seen before that we're going to do some ongoing research about. Next slide, please. So let's look at prevalence. So uh, these are the these are the ACE categories, and I want you to look uh, towards the bottom at emotionally abused, uh, excuse me, sexually abused and emotional neglect, and you can see that the prevalence for boys and girls is dramatically different. So you have girls very, very, very high rates of sexual abuse uh, and high rates of emotional abuse higher than boys in this study. Um, and when I do this with juvenile justice folks, I ask them to think about uh, given the difference in prevalence, um, think about the instances where girls are running away and what are they running from and what are they running to? And I think in schools, the question is, how does, their, how does exposure to these, these two, they're all important, but particularly for girls, these two impact their behaviors in school? So next slide. So what's school's responsibility? Um, most of you probably know this, but to make sure that we're sort of on the same page, as Stephanie said earlier, the primary issues for children experiencing toxic stress and trauma are these, attachment, uh, they need relationships, they have a lack of connection and trust, regulation uh, around feelings and behavior, they can tend to be dysregulated very easily or triggered, and they can be perceived to be unmanageable uh, they have, in terms of competencies, challenges of concentrating and being able to learn. Um, so really, I think it's pretty clear, and I think it was clear from Stephanie's comments too, that schools really have a responsibility to create these safe environments of trust and mutual respect uh, where you can support healing informed engagement, uh, which is which is inclusive of supporting them to recover from trauma, but is yet, I think, different in terms of relationship and tone and texture. And Stephanie earlier had a slide about what does healing informed mean, uh, but that this is between students and staff, uh, students and each other, staff and parents, and parents with their children. Uh, if 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 we think about what system exists in society that is our best sort of early warning, how do we catch children and families before they end up in deeper in systems like child welfare and juvenile justice? It really is the schools. And so uh, there's, a I think, a high level of responsibility to create those environments uh, to be supportive, not only of children, but of parents and families, and in particular, girls. Um, and make a shift uh, really from focusing on what children have done, Stephanie mentioned this also, to what happened to them at home and in school. Uh, it is, of course, important to understand and respect the context of their lives at home, but understanding how that reflects their behavior in school and being sensitive to that is even more critical. And certainly ACE can be a tool for schools sort of as a predictive, um, some a little bit of a predictive data in terms of interpretation of behaviors. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we interpret behaviors. So next slide. So what's the challenge for schools? I, I think that there's probably not much um, argument that folks who work in schools care about children um, and we've, I think the responsibility is clear. You know, you have to you have to address the impact of students' behaviors on themselves, other staff, and the school community. Uh, and yet, I think often that's done in a vacuum, uh, with an internal focus um, and a punitive focus, rather than one that is healing informed and takes into account the full context of students' lives. So students who are experienced or have experienced toxic stress and ACEs come to school with a set of coping mechanisms and behaviors that help them navigate their own environment and are their attempts to manage trauma uh, that results from the stress and the adversity. So it's important to focus on the stress, but equally important to remember what's causing the stress because you're getting closer each time you do that, you're getting closer to what the root cause is, which is this next point, which is um, really shifting the frame on how you relate to the behaviors that you're seeing and look, think about the root causes. And again, ask about what's happened or happening to them. A singular focus on what did you do most often results in punitive responses. And I think if you look at some of the data on school resource officers that Georgetown and, and uh, Monique Schott put out, that's, that's pretty clear as well as uh, we're gonna move into another piece around social norms. Next slide. So where does it all go wrong? Um, I've done a lot of training over the last 
30, 35 years. And there is no question that uh, by and large, I would say that people people mean well, they are compassionate, they, they care about others, particularly those in education and other helping fields. And yet we have this data that's inarguable when it comes to race and gender. Uh, when we look at discipline, we look at, at punitive, you know, who suffers, who receives more punitive responses than others. Um, so I'm going to try to put a couple things together to get us thinking and talking about it. These are really complicated subjects, and I have no as illusion that we're going to solve this. But I hope these are some grains of salt, so, uh, grains of salt that you can take with you to think about and and, and internalize, and then really think about your own um, your own barriers, your own limitations, because we certainly all have them. And and I mean, the limitations we carry because we are good people, not because we are bad people. So looking at the impact of social norms on how we perceive the behaviors of girls and boys differently is critical. Um, most often there's a lack of an intersectional lens. We have to have an intersectional lens that recognizes the impact of all students' identities, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, class, on how their behaviors are perceived. Um, and we we let's underline implicit bias because I think the impact of implicit bias on perceptions and therefore on decision making is a topic we don't like to talk about. It's it's a it's not concrete and yet it's something that we all carry around with us. So next slide. So let's start with gender-based attributions and then we'll talk more about implicit bias and race. So you know there's this very very you know being a hundred. 35 years old as an organization, I, we go back and we read the writing of, of our founders and we see this very puritanical view of girls and we see it, uh, we play out in kind of the gender-based attributions and the social norms about being boys and being girls. Uh, and there's a pretty strong, I'm sure everybody's heard it, you know, boys will be boys, boys are gonna grow out of it, They're, it's just a phase. They're sowing their wild oats, we make excuses for them as they are growing, going through a phase. Uh, girls, uh, you know, we tend to have a more moralistic, puritanical view of girls. Uh, long been thought, um, you know, uh, if you're older, if you're like me, um, but but even I think more recently, there there's verbalization of, you know, there are girls that you marry and there are girls that you don't. Uh, girls guard, girl, good girls are X, Y, and Z, bad girls are X, Y, and Z. Um, and once a bad girl, always a bad girl. And I have to say that the girls that we, um, the girls that actually provide leadership to us are really clear that these are things, this idea of being a bad girl, less than, not as valued, not as respected, not as worthy, are things that they receive every day through society um, that they carry with them deep kind of in their, in their gut um, and aren't even always aware when it's impacting them. And uh, as we see girls of color disproportionately represented and every negative outcome indicator, I think we have to recognize that, that this is even more pervasive for girls of color. Next slide, please. So implicit bias is hugely complicated and there's a bunch of stuff on this slide, but let me kind of boil it down to what's in the title and then the few characteristics of implicit bias. You know, implicit bias really refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect how we understand, interact, make decisions, uh, operate in the world in an unconscious manner. Um, it is the stuff that is in the air that we breathe from the time we're young, that we pick up through the media, through our relatives, through friends, through what we read, uh, through what we hear. Um, it, is, is, it, is, um, it is pervasive. Everyone has it. This is not something that only white people have. We all have it. And we almost all want to say that we don't have them. Uh, very, very good, well-meaning people carry deeply held implicit biases. Everyone has them. Uh, and this next point I think is really important that implicit and explicit biases uh, are related, but they are they are different mental constructs. So you can say all the right things because you truly believe them. And yet you can act through implicit biases in a way that is discriminatory uh, and unfair and unjust. Uh, and that is why it's very difficult to get our arms around. I think it is it, in, absolutely essential that we understand that having, these in, that having these implicit biases is not actually the problem because we all have them. The question is whether you are able to acknowledge that you have them, be accountable, be aware, uh, and, and be honest and admit that you have biases. We all treat people differently for a number of different factors. The problem is that we, when we believe that we don't, and when you have privilege, it's easy to do that. 
Um, again, the implicit associations don't hold consistent or are aligned with our beliefs. Now, you probably see my lights just went off. We have smart lights. So I'm going to wave my arms and hope the lights come back up. There we go. They're back up. Um, we generally tend to hold implicit bias that favor our owning group, obviously. Um, but I think that in really important point that we have to remember is that they are somewhat malleable if we recognize that we have them that we carry them our brains are very very complex but also very very flexible and always developing so we can actually gradually turn around the negative impacts of implicit bias by recognizing that we have them if we don't admit that we have them we have no choice so it's really chance it's really critical that we each understand that we each carry these within ourselves. I have done a lot of work. I know what a lot of mine are and I can be on the guard for them. But anytime you hear someone say they don't have any biases, they treat everybody the same, that's your first clue that they're unaware of their implicit biases. Next slide, please. So race and ethnicity impacts how we apply gender-based norms. The race and ethnicity of the person we are interacting with or focused on as well as our own. And I think we have to be very clear and very honest that the perception as it relates to gender roles and gender expectations is the perceptions of who's a good girl is based on being a white middle class. That's the ideal of a good girl in appearance and behavior. So any derivation from that you're further down the scale if you think of it as a continuum, good girl on one end, bad girl on the other. Um, the minute you, you are perceived as a girl of color, that moves you down that continuum closer to being toward the bad end. How we perceive behaviors is very, very much impacted by a, uh, that, and the actions that we take are impacted by our perceptions. So next slide. So I'm going to do a little bit of communication 101 uh, about how we perceive and communicate about behavior. So we can we see something, and there are three ways that we can uh, can talk about it. We can describe it, which is very literal description. I'm going to give you an example in a minute. We can interpret it, which means we begin to ascribe meaning to what we are seeing. And third, we can evaluate it, which means we're making judgments about what's going on. Now, we all do this. It's very, very rare that you're going to see something on the street. You're going to see two people interacting, and you're literally going to describe it. You're not going to interpret it. You're not going to begin to try to um, project what is going on. And it's even more um, it's probably it's more probable that you're actually going to evaluate. You're going to make a judgment about what you're seeing there. The problem is that if we're not aware of those three options and we're always going to evaluation, we're making a judgment and we're basing our actions based on that judgment and we're not holding ourselves accountable for implicit bias, we're going to have problems be because we're going to be acting in ways inconsistent with what the situation really is. Next slide. So here's an example. So here's a situation, and I have intentionally not made it an educational setting because I don't want us to spend time during discussion arguing about that. So we see three police officers having a discussion with each other near five males while a fourth officer is at the car holding a radio. Now we can describe this, we can interpret it, or we can evaluate it. Next slide. So look at the difference between these three. Okay, the police officers are talking to each other while five men stand nearby. The fourth officer is using a car radio. Fear description. Interpretation. The police officers look angry and the Mexican men look scared and must be in trouble. The fourth officer is calling for help. Now look at evaluation. I don't like what I see. The police are harassing Mexicans. This is a bad situation. Other evaluation. I like what I see. The police are doing a good job protecting the community. Two exactly opposite evaluative observations on which actions will be based of the same situation. We don't really know, do we? And yet we're going to evaluate it and we're going to take action. So putting it all together, you're fine. Go ahead. Next slide. So this is the last slide. So putting it all together, we have to be cons we have to pay attention to students' behavioral and emotional responses um, because we are going to interpret those. We're going to describe it, interpret it, or evaluate it. We have to understand gender role expectations as it relates to their behaviors uh, and how they are perceived. We're gonna have to pay attention to implicit biases rooted in stereotypes. You have to understand that there is a hierarchy of human value that places white males at the top. 
Uh, we have to understand that we need to have an intersectional lens and understand that the perceptions we have and judgments we make about others have serious consequences. We're not, when we're not using an intersectional lens and we are not aware of our implicit biases, that's when we get disparity, a disproportionality and injustice. So my question to you, not to be answered now, but to think about leaving from here is how does all of this impact the application of dress code policies, school discipline and creating a culture of healing and safety in schools? Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, that includes our slides, so I'm going to take us off uh, the screen share. And uh, Johanna, feel free to facilitate, um, facilitate discussion. Excellent. That was fantastic, Jeanette. Thank you for all of that information and really pointing out uh, the disproportionality for um, Black girls in the schools as well. And also thank you, Dr. Covington, for all of your work um, with the ACES research. Um, one of the questions that I that was brought up for me in all of this discussion was that we were speaking about um, trauma-informed experiences with young girls in their intimate social spaces. Um, and I wanted to just kind of open it up because we have a lot of people that are working directly um, with Black girls in other environments. And so how do we um, identify trauma that is initiated in those environments and not so much in the intimate social circles, but in the schools, at the programs that the young girls go to, walking on the street, <laughs> being in stores, um, some of those spaces where we're also able to identify that there's a lot of toxic trauma and stress um, that are communicated um, or put on these young people. And I lost everyone. <laughs> Feel free to um, submit your um, questions in the question box. Are there any questions? doesn't look like there's any questions that are being populated from our attendees. Okay, looks like we have one question that's come in. One second. Okay, here's our first question. If you are working with a child who has expressed difficulty in class, how would you begin the discussion? And we can have either of our presenters answer that question, Jeanette or Stephanie. Okay, I'll, this is Stephanie, I'll, I'll answer that. I think there's a very simple, I'm gonna give you sort of a quick overview of that brief conversation that I mentioned. And Stephanie, and, you could turn your camera on. Yeah, OK. How about that? I'm back again. OK, so I think when a child's talking about having difficulty in any situation, you can say, you know, we know that a lot of kids here are struggling and have had difficult things in their life. And I can show you some things that we can do when you're, when you're feeling uh, overwhelmed or distressed. And there are a couple very simple things we teach kids to do. But we also need to, let's if this is a classroom, we have to set up a place for children to feel like they can go to, um, to kind of regroup the picture that I showed you that, um, uh, was in one of the classrooms that one was in Tennessee but even saying to kids you know we what we call them grounding exercises or self-soothing exercises it's ways to comfort themselves and one of them is breathing just you know when you're feeling distressed breathe in and breathe out like you're trying to blow out a candle and do that six times and see if that helps you feel more comfortable so there's these really simple exercises that teachers are teaching kids in classrooms as well as having spaces in classrooms for kids to go when they're when they're feeling distressed that's that emotional dysregulation i mentioned and the 
that Jeanette talked about. Mm -hmm. So you, you make it very, um, you want to make this child realize they're not alone and that there's some things they can do and that you're there to help them. I also would add that with um, some autonomy for the young person is how are they identifying what difficulty in class they might be having? Like mm -hmm. if they're thinking that they're having difficulty in class or if it's actually initiated from um, behavior management on the facilitator, the teacher's um, point of view, that also might help to inform how to respond to the young person. Since we're just about out of time, I just want to say I have one other question for our presenters. Um, one of our attendees asked, I work in a school as a social worker. What major takeaways would you suggest communicating to teachers who might be unaware of A scores or past student trauma? And either one of you are free to answer. Jeanette, maybe if you want to start. Sure. Well, one of the things we found in our administration is, you know, I think that people are get nervous about administering the ACE because they think that it's going to trigger everyone. And um, in our use of it with staff and actually with young women who are advocates, actually young women who have scores of eight, nines and tens, uh, we found actually the opposite that is incredibly empowering. Uh, it, it oftentimes puts the pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, they see themselves as survivors and they understand why they are, why they are where they are, that they're not bad, they're not stupid. Um, um, and I, th I think it's really important to, to, to remember that you can present the data on ACE without asking people to do the survey, right? So I think um, oftentimes it's, it's more effective to just share the information as things that you need to know to be a competent person working in the human service field and then let them make the choice about whether to take it or not. And understanding too that uh, ACE scores tend to not be single generation, right? So you have kids with high scores, you very, very likely have parents and grandparents with high scores also. And my quick answer would be, I think everybody, that we, what we're beginning to see is a belief that everybody that works with people needs to have some understanding of trauma. And so now we are talking about trauma-informed schools, trauma-informed hospitals, trauma-informed juvenile justice system. Philadelphia is becoming a trauma-informed city. So this whole concept of people interacting with people need to have an understanding of trauma. And as you said, Jeanette, the school is a really important place for this information to um, be available to those interacting with kids. Right, and we really focused on mental health today, but there are a whole series of connections to chronic disease, and those are, those are critical too to understanding health disparities. Uh, and for individuals who just wanna live a healthier long life, if that's the way in for them, then that's the way in. Yes, and this issue of um, trauma-informed is becoming so prevalent that they even are talking about a DSM-5, um, I think, right. uh, indication for uh, trauma and toxic stress, which then will also inform and help folks get services and the care that they need. Mm -hmm. And so we are at 1.33, so we are at our time. We want to thank our well-informed, knowledgeable speakers and presenters today who gave us fantastic information uh, to service our young people in our school communities and any communities that we have um, interaction or engagement with them. And at this point, we are going to thank them and wave them off. <laughs> and right. we can stay on for the next half hour if folks want to continue some of the conversation and answer some more of the questions. We just will not have our expert panelists on because folks are time constrained. Thank right. you so Thank much. you. Thank you. Bye. All right. So I am here. And I'm not sure. I think I need my friend Becca to make sure that or to let me know if there's still people on. Hi, yes, there are 73 people on and we have eight questions in the queue. But All right. feel free to facilitate as you see fit. Um, so I, it looks like I lost my questions in the queue. <laughs> oh no, there I got them again. All right, so let's go back. Uh, traumatized, okay, so the next question was, um, third question, as an educator, how do I inform 
and or work with the parent of girls of color who have an ACE score of four or more. Um, and again, let's go back to anyone who has an ACE score of four or more, which is highly prevalent in our communities today. Um, I think some of the important parts, one, you could share this webinar to allow folks to understand this ACE study, the indicators that they um, have established for us to be able to look at and identify that there is a need for services and or care. Um, and then in working directly with a parent of, a, of the girls, um, always to inform the parents that the young people have participated in um, an ACE study uh, scoring so that they are informed about what it is that their young person has engaged in for them to even come up with the indicator. Um, and then to, if there's not resources directly within the school, there might be community resources that the parents and the student can be um, linked to. There's all kinds of wonderful restorative practice that is being incorporated into most of our school um, systems these days. Administrators and teachers are well aware of that. Um, that allows a circle space for people to come together and have conversations um, to really address. And again, with most of these trauma-informed, um, depending on the severity of the incidences that uh, gave the increase in the score would determine whether or not the person should be referred to counseling, which would be a, a really important part. Um, and, and that camp counseling should be uh, family therapeutic in nature. Um, and next, the next question, and I was, gosh, I'm hoping that I can have anybody who's also an expert that works in the community, not to just be hearing my voice and my answers, but if there's anyone who wants to, in the chat box in some way, also offer some suggestions, you're more than welcome to. I did think that we were going to be able to open it yes. up to people Please being able to respond. Yeah, if you can raise your hand, I will unmute you. Um, just be patient because I'm trying to man everything. <laughs> Multiple hands going on. Um, so I will ask the fourth question. I am a school, uh, I work in a school as a social worker. What major takeaways would you suggest communicating to teachers who might be, did we ask that question? Unaware of the ACE scores or past student trauma? I think we answer that yeah, on a larger scale. Okay. The fifth question, why was the study only done? Ooh, oh, it, it popped me down. Um, uh, done on girls of color. Um, so the ACE study was not um, just done on girls of color. It was done um, in a, a cross-section of, of community. We are focusing with the learning network on girls of color. And so that's why we spent majority of the time talking about those specification that's applied to girls of color. We do understand and know the data shows us that uh, black girls in particular are disproportionately affected um, by the ACE scores, by um, toxic trauma and stress. Um, they have a higher prevalence of uh, some of the punitive uh, measures that are taken in schools that support the uh, school to prison or confinement pipeline. And so we really do want to uh, amplify that information to communities, especially communities that are working directly with black girls so that they can be one made aware of it and then start to formulate strategies, programs, policies, procedures to help to transform that space so that um, we we get to a, a, a more equitable educational environment is what I want to say. <laughs> um, the sixth question, how is, if any, our Department of Education moving forward with policy on facilita facilitating schools to all be trauma-informed? We know it helps. I don't know if anybody else can help me with that. I have no idea about what the Department of Education is doing um, as a state agency in particular, um, but I do know that we are able to uh, move things di in with direct response. Um, and so if there are people that are working in schools or we know and all of the folks that were signed up for this webinar have direct um, relationship with young people in schools and or some form of teaching or administrative role with in the schools. Um, 
So um, I'm looking for hands being raised. Um, I'm not seeing any right now, but please raise your hand if you want to help um, answer the question specific to the de uh, Department of Education. As people recognize it in themselves, very sad when safe place members show this bias. So what I will say, and I think that what Jeanette was talking about is that dealing with and working with implicit bias takes years and years and years of uh, practice. And so not just posing the information about implicit bias, but also uh, folks being very active. I see that we have a hand raised, so I'd love to hear from the hand. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. Um, you are now unmuted. Catherine, um, we saw you raise your hand. Um, you're unmuted now. Okay, we can't hear. Um, so I'm gonna please raise your hand again if you would like to participate. There's a question about, are there trainings um, for teachers specific to today's calls? There is a wealth of training. Um, I can have everyone, direct everyone to uh, the Learning Network's website. Maybe, Becca, you can post that in this chat so people can have the link um, to be able to join as a member. And then there, there are a number of resources that are provided, and we will also make sure that there are uh, that there are training information yeah, provided. Wanna, that's a great point. Um, a, a few people have asked now about where to find this recording and webinar slides and the resources we talked about. And so we'll email um, the Learning Network um, after the webinar to share the links where those will be posted. OK. I'm going to jump down to question 10. I find that being a school nurse, that we are not counted in as being able to help students with ACEs often. We see more than we see more than counselors, yet we are often told we are not skilled to help them. It's frustrating. I don't think it is one person's function. How can we all work together? Um, I, yeah, that, I think that's a fantastic uh, point to be brought up. Um, and it's not just the school nurses who can support um, the ACE learning and the studies. It's any young, any person that is has direct relationship and contact with um, the students. The one thing that I do um, that I would say is necessary in administering the ACE because you are talking about trauma is to have somebody who is well versed um, and has professional licensing um, in case there is. Uh, emotional impact from participating in the ACE study. I have had experiential um, dealings with administering ACE in classes and then needing to hold space for the young people who are then triggered and reminded of the impacts. But as Jeanette was saying, when they have administered it, this um, the space and held space for young people to have conversations with one another, that has um, amplified and elevated the young people to understand why um, they're having some of these reactions to uh, the triggers that are presented to them. Uh, additionally, I'm, I know that it would be a policy component to allow um, nurses, if there is a training that folks can participate in um, that specifically addresses administering the ACE and then providing services after the administration, um, that would be great. And I'm sure that we'll be able to post some resources via the Learning Network about those levels of training. Um, and that would be to be asked at the school board level in most of the localities uh, to allow that to be certification criteria for school nurses and or other support staff within the schools to be able to support young people um, either administering the ACE scores and after administering them, providing them with services but it's also really important to always have a coordination of care um, in that space. Do we have any raised hands that I need to address? We do not have raised hands right now, but we did, okay. um, Catherine submitted um, what she wanted to say um, in the question box um, after she had raised her hand before and she said,
Um, she wasn't sure about the DOE, but the CDC just posted some great information on ACEs, um, and we'll be putting up info to educators on um, their great resources about schools. So um, thank you, Catherine, and um, I can look into that, and um, we can post some of those resources to circulate um, after this webinar. Excellent. Um, I'm seeing question, another question I think that is really important to address is how do you begin the conversation with a young lady about ACEs score of seven or more when the young lady is desensitized to her own trauma? And this is a really big issue um, because as we saw even in our ACE um, questions today that anybody dealing with black girls in particular will have the higher ACE scores. Um, I think that there's an opportunity again to pull together um, young people in restorative circles and in those restorative circles there becomes a commonality and an opportunity for young people to have conversations so that they are not isolated with the impacts of their trauma so that it is brought up that a, no, a number of young people could have been experiencing violence in their community um, and then be able to have conversations about methodologies and tools to be able to manage those levels of stressors. Um, there's also an opportunity, most of the time that happens in, in a community space where they're sharing the commonalities. It's fantastic to have peer-on-peer -peer, um, support uh, talking circles uh, with young people in addition to that. Um, and with desensitizing trauma, I think that using the ACE study helps to identify and amplify the things that are um, has been designated as traumas. So for somebody who is desensitized to traumas, having it listed out, some of the things that are um, considered traumas or stressors. There's also wonderful resources about what are stressors that young people don't typically think of. Hearing something like loud music for a, a large amount of time could be a stressor to someone's um, body. And as soon as um, young people are provided with that information, then they start to be able to be less desensitized to what the trauma is. Um, another addition from the audience, I would also add that our school nurses request annual training in the ACE 101 training and continuous professional development, maybe along with other school personnel, including any the janitor. So to have trainings in schools is a, a fantastic opportunity. Um, and I thank the person for submitting that. I don't know exactly who it is to actually name you. I'm sorry. Um, let's see there. Did I miss some? I'm an instructional coach supporting high school teachers in alternative learning centers. Our girls of color are really struggling. Everything else is so important. The social connections, their flows, the outside world. It is challenging to make the relationship connection when teachers are so time limited. Do you have suggestions on making connections in the high schools? Um, well, some of the things that we do in Miami-Dade County Public Schools is utilize um, all of our uh, our vol volunteer uh, organizations. Um, so there are um, programs that are administered through Planned Parenthood. There are um, volunteer community group, organiz girls organizations and groups. They come in and they hold space um, during the classroom day um, so that it's a designated period of time where young people are um, not pulled out in a negative way, but pulled out to have healing spaces um, and or to talk in a group setting amongst each other about the traumas because teachers are time limited with getting all of their uh, curriculum content addressed in their limited amount of time. And sometimes they don't have the opportunity to deal and manage behaviors in the way that they would like to, especially because our schools are impacted with um, large classroom sizes. Um, and so let me go back to make sure I'm answering all the components of that. Um, so there's opportunity there and also with the after school program, linking young people to um, after school girls programs that are in the neighborhood also helps to because they will be able to address um, some of these issues in those spaces and allow girls to formulate um, and provide them with tools to be able to manage some of the stressors um, in a better, more effective way. Let's see. 
have you seen that just having the conversation about, okay, we answered that one. The A scores. And I don't have any more questions at this time that I haven't addressed. I'm glad that folks have stayed on. I'm hoping that um, in the future we have an opportunity to uh, be able to have an actual conversation with some of the folks that have stayed on in office hours. We like to make this time and space available for people to really um, create and develop a dialogue. Uh, with On the Learning Network site, there is opportunity for people to post their questions and then allow the larger community to be be in responsiveness to those questions so that we can start having uh, greater dialogues about that. And again, that link will be shared with all of um, the participants in the webinar today. I see you, Rebecca. Hi, Johanna. I actually, while we're waiting to see if there are any more questions, my connection went out briefly and I wondered whether you had um, addressed the question about the Department of Education. I did address the question about the Department of Education, and we also had one of our participants respond that the CDC just came out with some fantastic um, uh, resources that on the ACEs study and some trainings. And so um, we'll try to coordinate that. So I would just add, just as a lawyer myself, um, there's been some alarms that have been set off because the, um, the current Department of, of Education has announced their um, intention to rescind the guidance that was put into place. Um, and did you did you address this already, Johanna? Because I'm worried that so I did their, not. their intent is to rescind the guidance that was issued by the Obama administration, in which they raised the problems inherent in traditional discipline and, in particular, its disparate um, impact on students of color. And although the Obama administration put a, a focus on boys of color in particular, we know well that um, girls of color, particularly black girls, have been disproportionately affected by traditional discipline. Um, and this directly intersects with ACEs because if, if schools are not aware of ACEs and aren't trauma informed and how they respond to students, it's the students with the high ACE scores that are going to get pushed out of school. So um, right now there's a period of commentary about that intention to rescind those guidelines and it's important that um, folks be aware um, that that is a development that is ongoing at this moment. Yeah, that, that will be important for us all to uh, pay attention to <laughs> and lend our knowledge and expertise in the space. Um, and again, if things are coming from um, the, the administration, um, then our best methods of being able to address young people is to be able to try to incorporate these on an individual level in our classrooms, then with our school administration, with our school administrators, um, and that will help us to, to kind of reduce the impact on black girls disproportionately. All right, I see we have another question, so I'll take myself off. Thanks, Johanna. Of course, no. Uh, in Delaware, oh, I lost it. In Delaware, we are building capacity in our K through 12 systems, out of school care providers and early childhood systems by connecting the brain science using the brain architecture game. Well, the brain architecture game sounds like awesome fun. It's always really good to incorporate play, especially when dealing with um, young people whose amygdalas are still formulating that helps them to center and refocus. Um, and that's awesome. I don't know what the question is in that, but now that we know that there is a architecture game, we can also look for that resource and maybe that can be made available on our um, learning network communications um, site. And it doesn't look like there's any more questions. And we are also coming up to the end of our extra half hour office hours. Um, if people like this format of having the office hours, um, then that would be great to let us know in response to this webinar. Um, and we also could try to make these available.
more regularly. But we also just want to, again, redirect people to the learning network, uh, to our chat um, area where folks can then communicate and start having conversations with each other. Do my colleagues, Becca and Rebecca, have anything else to add? No, this has been wonderful. This is Becca behind the scenes. <laughs> Come back from behind the scenes, Becca. Okay, okay. <laughs> Bye -bye. This is Hi. our orchestrator. <laughs> Yay. Excellent job. So I would just want to thank everyone for participating and especially for staying on. Um, it's so helpful, Johanna, to have you on to offer us some practical from the field advice and wisdom. So thank you so much for that. And thanks to everyone who spent their time, which I yes. know is precious for everyone uh, in not only attending the webinar, but also these office hours. Excellent. And uh, after that, I guess we'll sign off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so All much. All right. Have a great one.